بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قد افلح من زكاها وقد خاب من دساها وقال تبارك وتعالى ان الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد respected listeners assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh The verses which I've just recited are from Surah Al-Shams in which Allah says والشمس وضحاها والقمر إذا تلاها والنهار إذا جلاها والليل إذا يغشاها والسماء وما بناها والأرض وما تحاها ونفس وما سواها فالهمها فجورها وتقواها قد افلح من زكاها وقد خاب من دساها الله swears by a number of objects in his creation and this is the custom in many of the surahs of the quran in order to emphasize a certain point Allah places an introduction before the actual statement and in many instances this introduction is a series of oaths a number of things by which Allah actually swears and in this surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by the sun its mid-morning brightness Allah swears by the moon as well as the following sorry Allah swears not by the moon Allah swears by the sun and its mid morning brightness and then Allah swears by the day and the moon when it follows the sun Allah also swears by the night when it settles with its darkness Allah swears by the heavens and by himself who created the heavens Allah swears by the earth and he himself who spread the earth and Allah also swears by the soul and by he who guided the soul to both its good as well as its evil and if i just translate the words Allah azza wa jalla says by the sun and its mid-morning brightness and by the moon when it follows the sun and by the day when it reveals the sun and by the night when it envelops the sun and by the sky and he who created it and by the earth and he who spread it out and by the soul and he who created the soul and having created the soul fa alhamaha fujuraha wa taqwaha he allah the creator having created the soul allah also inspired it to both its good as well as its evil having sworn by all of these things major and great of his creation the sun the moon the night the day the mid-morning brightness of the sun the darkness of the night the brightness of the day the earth and it's being spread out the sky and it's being elevated and he allah who created the earth the sky 
and such, and having sworn by the soul, and by he who created the soul again, having sworn by so many objects, the statement that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes is the following. That he who purifies the same soul, he is successful. And he who does not purify the soul, but leads it astray, or doesn't allow the soul to flourish and to grow, he is the one who is a great loser. So the answer to Allah's oaths, the reply to all the oaths that Allah takes, and, to, and the statement that follows this mighty introduction that Allah gives in the beginning of the surah, is about the, is about the soul, about the nafs, about the ruh. That he who purifies the soul, he is successful. And he has lost out. He has suffered a great loss. Who does not purify the soul, but allows it to become wayward. And who actually leads the soul astray. Now this is just <coughs> one verse, sorry, just two verses of the whole Qur'an. Which speak about the inner spirit. Which speak about the soul. And the need for the purification of the soul. There are many of the verses of the Qur'an that allude to this, that refer to this. And in many verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken of the function and the duty of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he came to this dunya to guide mankind. Allah has described it as one of his responsibilities, as one of his functions of prophethood, as one of his duties and tasks to fulfill in the world, Allah says time and time again, وَيَزَكِّيهِمْ وَيَزَكِّيهِمْ in different verses. That he, the Prophet of Allah, apart from relating the verses of the Qur'an to the people, and apart from teaching them the wisdom and the book, the meanings of the book, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would also purify their souls. Now, today we live in an age of materialism. And today's talk has been titled Spirituality in a Material World. And the reason for this is that we live in a very material world, a very materialistic society, in which materialism has become a religion and a philosophy in itself. And the impact, the influence of materialism as a philosophy, as a way of life, as a concept, as a lifestyle, as a religion. The impact of all this is so profound and so strong and so far-reaching that it affects even the Muslims. And the word materialism, materialistic, although in the first instant the word materialism conjures up images or connotations of the love of wealth, the love of money, being attached to the dunya, etc., it's not just about the love of wealth. Materialism is a whole philosophy, it's a way of life, and it's become, like I said, a religion in itself. But the philosophy of materialism is that people believe only in that which is material. People believe in and accept only that which is tangible, which is physically present, which you can touch, which you can feel, which you can sense which you can know of. And only if you can touch it, do you believe in it. And that means, initially, people are attached to wealth and anything related to wealth because it's something they can experience, they can feel, they can make use of, they can exploit. That's why when you promise someone payment in monetary terms or in physical terms, and on the other hand, you promise someone a reward in the hereafter, what do people go for? They obviously go for money. Now, this love of materialism, or this belief in materialism, extends much further than the love of wealth. Soon people begin to believe and accept only that which is tangible, physically present, which is material, which is related to matter. Anything spiritual, they either doubt it or they actually begin to deny it altogether. And that's why crass materialism, when it's taken to its extreme, includes and involves the denial of Allah. That's where materialism will lead you. 
The denial of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because materialism, in its strictest sense, does not accept the existence of anything immaterial. Anything which doesn't exist in the five senses. Anything which a person cannot feel or physically experience or touch. Anything which isn't tangible. Anything which is transcendental. Anything which is beyond one's senses of hearing, seeing, touching and smelling. A person will not accept. And that's why today there's a real clash between dunya and religion. There's a real clash between the modern lifestyle and religion. Why? Modern lives, the whole modern lifestyle rests on the foundation of materialism. Much of today's civilization rests on the principles and the foundations of materialism. And in contrast to that, the whole of religion, whilst taking the material dunya into consideration, religion rests on spirituality. Religion rests on the unseen. Religion rests on the ilm al-ghayb, on ghayb. And that's why in the very beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praising the believers. What does Allah say in the very beginning of the Qur'an? Alif Lam Mim Dhalik Al-Kitabu La Raiba Fi Hudan Lil Muttaqeen Al-Ladheen Yu'minun Bil Ghayb Alif Lam Mim This is a book in which there is no doubt. It is a guidance for those who have taqwa. And then who does Allah describe as being the people who possess taqwa? Alladheen Yu'minun Bil Ghayb Allah doesn't say they pray and they fast. He mentions that later. Their primary quality is their primary attributes is الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ Those who believe in the unseen. And that's what the whole of Iman rests on. So today there is a clash between materialism and spirituality. Materialism, as I said, is a whole philosophy. It's not just about the love of wealth. It actually stretches back all the way to the origins of life. What do you believe about the origin of life? That's part of materialism. Materialism says that there is no God who is the creator. And he created the universe, he created man and placed him upon the earth for, an, for a higher purpose. No. Materialism cannot accept that. They cannot be, materialism or people who subscribe to materialism cannot accept, cannot believe that there is some God who exists, some supernatural force that exists, I'm only using their words. Something beyond what man can feel, touch, smell and experience himself. As a result, materialism leads a person to denying the very existence of Allah. How did life come about? We're all animals. People then believe in evolution. See, everything has to be explained in a material sense, in a scientific way. Something that you can grasp with your mind, touch, feel, sense with your senses. Experience personally. So materialism includes belief in evolution. Materialism includes belief in any philosophy that denies creationism, that denies the creation of Allah, the existence of Allah. Materialism believes in the non-existence of any religion or anything spiritual. Materialism means a denial of miracles. It means a denial of spirituality. It means the denial of the very existence of the ruh. Everything is just physical when they speak, when materialists, people who believe in materialism speak about the heart. They don't refer to the heart as being some ruh or spirit. They refer to the physical anatomy of a heart. Even the thought processes in a person's mind, they can be rationally explained, but this isn't just what it is. There is also something beyond the physical connections of neurons in the brain. Allah has given man something superior, intelligence. And Allah has given us a spirit. And spirit, we will never understand. The ruh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Isra, Allah says, وَيَسَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ قُلِ الرُّوحِ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي وَمَا أُوْتِيتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيل
They ask you regarding the ruh, the spirit. Say to them that the spirit is of the command of my Lord. And you have been given but very little knowledge. You will not understand the ruh. You will not understand the spirit. But we believe, we may not understand it. But we believe in his existence. And not just some vague, foggy belief in the existence of the ruh. As Muslims, it is our iman. That the whole of religion and in fact the very existence of man rests on the ruh. And not the body or the flesh. Not the bones. Now... Materialism denies all of this. They be- materialism believes in the heart, but not the qalb or the ruh or the spirit as we know of it. When people subscribing to materialism speak of the heart, they speak only of the physical heart and its function in anatomy. It pumps blood, it keeps a person alive. But what of that spiritual heart? There is no such thing as a spiritual heart in materialism. Materialism begins from the exi- denial of the very existence of a creator and Allah and it stretches and it extends to the denial of anything which is non-physical. That's materialism. So who are these materialists? Who are the people who believe in this materialism? And who subscribes to this religion of materialism? The truth is there is no official body. There is no officially recognized group of people who say we are materialists and we believe in the religion of materialism. (coughs) Materialism exists everywhere, in us. Anyone who becomes too attached to the dunya, who begins to stray away from spirituality and ruhaniyat and religion and then strays into the realm of materialism, the love of wealth, Reliance, not just belief, but reliance on that which is material, and non-reliance on that which isn't material, then this person is straying away from his religion, is straying away from spirituality, and is straying into the realm of materialism. He may not even accept of himself that I'm a believer in materialism, and as a result, a denier of spirituality. But a person doesn't have to say that. When a person acts and behaves and thinks in this manner, and his outlook of life reflects this, his love of wealth, his attachment to the dunya, his doubtfulness, or apathy, some people, they don't care whether there is life after death. They don't care whether there is a creator or there isn't. They haven't got the time, they're not bothered to delve into these things. They haven't taken a stand on the issue. They are not ardent believers in the presence or the absence of a creator. They just don't care. For them, it's all about the dunya. And as Allah quotes such people from the Quran, in the Quran, from the times of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah speaks about the pagan Arabs. Allah says of them that they have said, In here illa hayatuna dunya, namutu wa nahya, wa ma nahna min bubruthin. That... There is nothing but this worldly life, i.e. there was nothing before, there is nothing afterwards. There is nothing but this worldly life. All we do is we live and we die and we will not be resurrected. So there are many today who haven't got the time to argue about religion, whether religion is true or not, whether there is a creator or there isn't a creator, which of the religions is true. They just haven't got the time. They can't be bothered. They are too indifferent to the whole issue. For them, all they are concerned about is life as they know it and as they live it. And to live their life to the full. Now, whoever, whoever behaves in the same manner by tongue, by mind, by belief, or by profession of such a belief... This person may not be denying spirituality. He or she may not be denying religion. He or she may not be even denying belief in the akhirah. But their actions show otherwise. Their actions, their attachment to the dunya, their love of wealth, their disregard of those things that are connected to the hereafter, their disregard and doubtfulness about things that are related to the spirit, all of these things show that they are more reliant on the dunya, on a materialism, than they are on spirituality. Now this is where a believer should differ. 
This is where the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum differed. This is what Allah Azza wa Jal expects Muslims to differ in. And Allah describes them in the very beginning of the Quran as who? Alladheen yu'minun bil ghayb. Those who believe in the unseen. Materialism includes denial of everything spiritual. Such people, they don't believe in jinns. They don't believe in spirits. They don't believe in the ruh. They don't believe in the angels. Once they begin to deny the very existence of a creator, that they cannot feel, that they cannot see, that they cannot touch, that they cannot sense with any of their senses or with any of their faculties, then what else matters if they deny the very existence of Allah? They don't believe in anything spiritual, neither jinns, neither the spirit, nor the ruh, nor the angels. Now, as Muslims, it'd be kufr, it'd be open kufr, blatant disbelief and kufr to actually deny any of these things. But it's not the profession of the tongue that matters. It's one's actions that matter. Now, if a person by tongue, he says, I'm a Muslim, of course, we are not going to call him a kafir. And nor should he consider himself a kafir. But if he by tongue says, I am a Muslim, by thought he continues to believe that he is a Muslim. But his whole lifestyle, his thought patterns, his philosophy, his outlook on life, his actions, his behavior, his inclinations, his desires and passions, his wants, his loyalties, all of these things are attached not to spirituality and religion and life after death and Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or belief in the unseen, but rather all of these things are attached to the dunya and to crass materialism. Then although we can't call him a kafir, he shouldn't call himself a kafir. Every one of us, to some degree, is affected by all of this. We should all stop, pause and think to ourselves, that which way am I heading? Is this the way of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum? Is this the way of the Prophets of Allah alayhim salatu wasalam? In this day and age, which preaches materialism in the most extreme sense, we have also become followers of materialism. Spirituality is an integral, essential part of Islam. The spirit means a lot. The ruh means a lot. And much of Islam is about spirituality. Now people have even made religion material, i.e. they want religion, they want Islam, they want belief in Islam, but they want it without the spirituality. Whereas if you look at the Qur'an, if you look at the life of Rasulullah wasallam, religion isn't just about everything that's apparent. Islam isn't just about what's apparent. A lot of our deen, a lot of our religion is about the hidden, the unseen. It's about spirituality. Today, just because we don't understand it, we deny it. Just because we don't understand it, we doubt it. Even though spirituality plays such a major role in our religion. If you look at the very belief, our belief is in the unseen. And as, as I said in the beginning, it is our belief that man, life, the existence of man, the very essence and the presence of a human being on earth, rests not on the body, but on his spirit. This body is just a cage, a means of transport. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he created Sayyidina Adam alayhi salatu wa salam, Allah azza wa jal didn't say to the angels and to the rest of creation that he instructed to prostrate before Sayyidina Adam alayhi salatu wa salam. Allah didn't tell them that when I've created man, i.e. his skin, his flesh, his body, as a bag of bones and blood, you prostrate to him. Allah says in the Quran, فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ Allah says, when I have fashioned and molded man, and then I have blown into him of my spirit, the spirit that is contained in man has a divine source. This is the ruh of Allah. We don't understand it, but it is. And Allah says clearly and categorically in the Quran, Allah told the angels, when I have fashioned man, molded him and created him, and then I have blown into him of my spirit, then you fall before him into prostration. That means Allah created Sayyidina Adam as a body, a body of flesh, bones and blood. But 
Allah didn't blow into him of his spirit immediately. And that's why from the narrations we learn that there was a great lapse of time before the physical creation of Sayyidina Adam alayhi salatu wasalam and the blowing into him of Allah's spirit. There was a great lapse of time. And Allah only instructed the angels to prostrate to him after the blowing of the spirit. Because that's what makes man a man. Not his body. And when Allah Azza wa Jal, this ruh existed, Allah created the ruh and the spirit well before. And Allah Azza wa Jal, as he mentions in the Quran, when he created the spirits, Allah extracted a promise from them. Of the recognition of Allah. Allah says, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ذُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدُهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَارُوا بَلَىٰ Allah says, remember the time when your Lord took from the backs of the children of Adam their own children. From each generation was extracted the next generation. And from that generation was extracted the third generation. And so on. Each subsequent, each generation from each generation, Allah extracted the subsequent generation. And we're not talking about the physical bodies here, we're talking about the spirits. And then all of the spirits that were destined, all of the arwah, all of those spirits, those ruh, arwah, that were destined to come into existence in the dunya, till from the beginning of time, till the end of uh, the dunya, till the end of time, till the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lined all of them up. And this is a, these are the words of the Qur'an. And remember the time when your Lord extracted from the backs of the children of Adam their own progeny, their own children. And then Allah extracted a promise from them. Allah made them a witness over themselves. And Allah questioned them. Alistu bi rabbikum. Am I not your Lord? And they all replied in unison, of course you are. Bala, of course. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extracted this promise from every single spirit that was destined to exist. And Allah explains later in the verse why he did this. أَن تَقُولُوا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Lest you say on the day of reckoning that we were unaware of this. That's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, كُلُّ مَوْلُودٍ يُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ Every human being, every child is born upon nature, is born upon fitrah. What is that fitrah? This is the same fitrah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created in every single soul. Before a child is born in the dunya, before the spirit enters the very fragile body of a child and a newborn baby, that spirit has already recognized its Lord. That spirit already knows its Lord. That spirit already has testified against itself that it has recognized and come to know Allah, its Lord and its creator. And that's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa refers to it as fitrah. But then parents, family, environment, these things affect a person and take the person, take the ruh and the spirit away from its natural state of fitrah and something else. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created mankind, Allah created Sayyidina Adam alayhi salatu wa salam, the body of bones of flesh and blood meant nothing. It was only after the spirit was blown into Sayyidina Adam alayhi salatu wa salam that Allah instructed the angels to fall into prostration before him. Before the spirit is given a body, life already existed. Life already existed. The ruh already existed. All that happens is that the spirit is removed from the realm of the spirits and placed in this body. It's actually made a prisoner in this cage of flesh, blood and bones. All this is is a cage. It's a means of transport. It's a container. And the spirit, the ruh is placed in that container and brought into the dunya for its short sojourn in the world. This is just a journey, nothing else. That's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has described the believer, not just the believer, but any human being, as being a traveller in the world. That's all he is, a traveller. He already existed before, he will continue to exist. And all this body does is serve as a container, a shell, a, a cage, a means of transport. Now, that's why in the Ahadith, in the Qur'an, and the whole of religion, we know, we learn, 
that we should pay attention. We should devote our attention not to the body, but rather to the spirit. That's why we have the month of Ramadan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the month of Ramadan. In the month of Ramadan, we deny ourselves certain things. We deny ourselves food, drink, and other desires and needs. If you look at them, all of them are to do with the body. Every one of them. And the reason our attention is diverted in the month of Ramadan from the body to the spirit is because for 11 months of the year, that's all we do. We lavish attention on our bodies. We worship our bodies. We indulge in gluttony. And going back to today's philosophy, it's all about materialism. Your life is your body. Your body is your life. There's no such thing as a spirit. There's no ruh. You do everything for your body. The shelter, the home, the clothing, the food, the drink, the pleasures, the luxuries, the indulgence of every kind. All of this is related only to the body. Only to the body. And people lavish such attention to the body that the body industry is the most profitable, the most valuable industry. Take any sector, medicine. Medicine is to do with the body. You want to keep your body healthy so you can have a longer life. And you can enjoy the quality of life. We feed ourselves to keep ourselves alive, but also to enjoy ourselves. We indulge in other passions and pleasures of the body. To us, our body is everything. The media, society tells you how you should look, how tall you should be, how large you should be, how you should be built, how you should appear. People go to the gym. Why? Forget non-Muslims, Muslims. You know what the non-Muslim saying is, my body is my temple. Now think about it, even the mentality, my body is my temple. That's why people worship their bodies. They actually worship their bodies. I've spoken yeah, only last week. A Muslim owner of a gym. He's a Muslim, he owns a gym. Only last week he was telling me, in his own words. He said, the clear majority of all the Muslims that come into the gym, they only come for one purpose. Because all our young people, all they come in for, is to pump their chests and their biceps. And they stand in front of the mirror, narcissistically admiring themselves. And they all do it so that they can go out on Friday and Saturday evening and look pumped up, strong. Not healthy, just pumped up, impressive and strong. All the attention on the body. You look at medicine, the medical industry. Medicine is all about prevention and cure of diseases that limit the functions of the body, that harm and damage the body. It's important to look after your body. Your body has a right over you. But there are many of the things and many of the people who have a right over you. You don't take this to the extreme. That's not fulfilling right, uh, the rights of the body. That becomes obsession. It becomes a religion and an act of worship in itself. Now we lavish attention on our bodies, but we completely ignore the spirit. And that's why in the month of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to deny ourselves those very same things with which we <coughs> indulge our bodies throughout the year. Food, drink, and other needs and desires. And by denying ourselves such things, we pay attention to the spirit, to the ruh. Just as the body has been created from the earth, its nourishment and its means of survival will also come from the earth. Allah has created the body from the dust of the earth. As a result, its nourishment will come from the dust of the earth. Crops, fruit, food, vegetation, even the animals, the meat of which we consume, their nourishment comes from the earth itself. So... This body is, has been created from the dust of the earth. Its nourishment will also come from the dust of the earth. But the spirit has not been created from the dust of the earth. The source, the origin of the spirit are divine. And just as the origin of the spirit is divine, its nourishment and its means of survival, its means of keeping itself healthy will also be divine. And that nourishment is the Quran of Allah. That nourishment is the dhikr of Allah. That nourishment is religion. That nourishment is spirituality. 
The ruh, its origin is spiritual, immaterial, non-material. And its cure, its prevention of disease, its means of keeping itself healthy, its means of survival, and its nourishment, all of these things are also heavenly and divine. They are celestial. They don't come from the earth. And as a Muslim, more attention should be paid to the spirit rather than the body. Now this is where materialism comes in. Materialism is a denial of spirituality. It's all about the body. It's about, all, all about money in the hand. It's all about what you feel and experience and sense yourself. And you only allow yourself to believe in and to act upon and to practice and to accept those things that you can actually physically feel that are tangible. Anything beyond that you deny. People deny spirituality, they deny the angels, they deny religion. And even if they don't actually deny it by their tongue, their way of life, their lifestyle, all shows that they don't really believe in these things. That's why you should ask yourself the question, who do, who do I rely on? What do I rely on? Someone who has yaqeen in his heart, conviction, faith and belief, he relies on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, we, we can't see God, we can't see such spiritual things, but if someone has iman and he actually relies on those things rather than material things, then Allah, but Allah will make him successful. It's all about the spirit, it's not about the body. That's why Allah in Surah Al-Shams, after swearing by so many things, what does Allah say? قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا He who purifies the soul, he is successful. He who doesn't purify the soul, but allows it to become wayward and leads it astray, he has lost out in every way. He, he, he is the greatest loser. For a Muslim, it's all about the spirit. It's all about the ruh. And if you look at every act of worship, what does it do? It reflects not on the body of man, but rather the ruh and the spirit of man. And that's why today as Muslims, Allah, we pray salah. We give zakah. We act on some of the laws, some, not all, but some of the laws of religion. But still, we, we do not care one little bit about spirituality, about ruhaniyat. Even though spirituality is the very essence of our existence. We are so concerned about the nourishment of the body. Food and drink and clothing and shelter. What about the food and the drink, the nourishment of the soul and its protection? We care about medicine. We care about disease. We are all fearful of disease. We are all fearful of sickness and sicknesses and illnesses. What about the sicknesses of the heart? The sicknesses of the spirit? Just like sicknesses of the body can destroy a person and end a person's life, the illnesses, the ailments, the sicknesses of the soul, the diseases of the soul can leave a person living as a corpse, but from within he has died a spiritual death. He has completely died. He is non-existent. He's dead. The spiritual diseases are even more dangerous, more lethal, more detrimental and more destructive than the bodily disease. Cancer, one piece of flesh in the body, it could be anything, one small piece of flesh. Forget flesh, since we're living in the technological age, go much further. One single cancer cell, one single virus, physical virus, one single cancer cell can replicate itself over and over again, spread throughout the body, consuming the entire body from within. It eats away at the flesh, it eats away at the organs of the body, it spreads rapidly and circulates throughout the body, destroying a person from within. Apparently he looks very healthy, but he eats him from within, and then there's sudden death. Or a sudden striking of a terminal illness which does not leave him alive except for a short while. Now, we fear, we fear physical ailments and diseases, but the diseases of the heart are far worse. What do we do about the diseases of the heart? If we don't believe in spirituality, or we may profess belief in spirituality, but we don't, in reality, we don't actually really believe or rely on such immaterial spiritual things that we can't see, we can't hear, we can't feel, people ignore them. The diseases of the heart destroy a person completely. Diseases such as malice, envy, jealousy, hatred, arrogance, pride, haughtiness, suspicion, doubt. All of these diseases related to the heart completely destroy a person. He, just like cancer from within, leaves a person standing, talking, eating. But it's eating away at him from within. 
Similarly, these diseases of the heart may have killed off his soul altogether. And in the book of Allah, he is already a loser. He is doomed. But he lives on. He continues to live. His flesh, his body is healthy, apparently. But from within, he has died a death. He is dead already, spiritually dead. And it's the spirit that matters. Because that's the essence of life. Now, even within religion, it's sad to see that Muslims deny spirituality. They may not say it, but they do not engage themselves in spiritual exercises. They do not busy themselves in eradicating the spiritual diseases of the heart. They don't busy themselves in trying to instill and inculcate their hearts with spiritual qualities. They may say that we believe in spirituality, but when you look at them in reality, they do not concern themselves with those things that are spiritual, like adorning the heart with those lofty spiritual qualities that Allah has mentioned in the Quran, that the Prophet ﷺ has mentioned in the hadith. And what is this a reflection of? Over reliance, over indulgence, extreme belief in materialism versus spirituality. In Surah Al Kahf, a surah that Allah meant Allah has, uh, the Prophet ﷺ has encouraged us to recite every week on Jumu'ah. Why Surah Al Kahf? Every Jumu'ah. There are many rewards for reciting Surah Al Kahf. One who recites Surah Al Kahf, Allah will create a nur, a light between him and the heavens, between him and the Kaaba. And from one week to the other, Allah will create a nur, a light for him. Allah will create protection for him from every fitna, even from the fitna of Dajjal. Just by the recitation, the tilawah of Surah Al Kahf. Why Surah Al Kahf? Surah Al Kahf is a very beautiful surah. There are many lessons to be drawn from there. But if you look at some of the major themes of Surah Al-Kahf, one, you will discover that there are four main stories of Surah Al-Kahf. One, the story of the cave, the people of the cave itself, after which the whole Surah has been named. Two, the story of the two men, one poor, one rich, and their conversations. Allah quotes that conversation in the Quran in Surah Al-Kahf. Number three, the story of Sayyidina Khidr alayhi salatu wassalam and Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wassalam. And number four, the story of Dhul Qarnayn. Now, if you look at all of these stories, they all represent the same struggle of spirituality and materialism. The story of the people of the cave, the young men, they believed in spirituality, they believed in religion, they believed in something beyond the powers of the people of their time. Beyond the wealth and the riches and the power of their kingdom, they believed in Allah. They believed in everything that went against the flow of their society, their community and their people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored them by mentioning them in the Quran. By immortalizing their story. The story of the two men, one rich and powerful as a result of his wealth. He relied only on his wealth, on his riches, on his family, kin, clan, on his children. And the other was poor, but he relied on Allah. He relied on that which others and he himself could not see. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in that short story in Surah Al-Kahf, Allah describes how his reliance and his belief in Allah survived and he as a result was more successful. The other, despite his riches and his apparent power and wealth and children, Allah has destroyed all he had before his very eyes in the dunya. Leaving nothing for him in the akhirah. The story of Dhul Qarnayn, same. A believer in Allah, who works with the power of Allah. And another thing, Dhul Qarnayn was mighty and he was powerful. And yet, despite his power, despite his wealth, and despite his strength, he himself says that more than all of this, is my reliance upon Allah. And then the most famous story of Surah Al-Kahf. The story of Sayyidina Musa and Sayyidina Khidr alayhim salatu wassalam. This story more than anything proves these two worlds. The material world and the hidden spiritual world. Just look at it. Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wassalam. One of the greatest prophets of Allah. 
he who brought the law, acted on the law, taught the law, implemented and applied the law. And in contrast, Sayyidina Khidr alayhi salatu wasalam, of a completely different realm. It's a very long story, we don't have time, I won't mention it in detail, but I mention those things that are relevant to this topic of spirituality and materialism. Now these are two different worlds. And we in this day and age, we've begun to almost disbelieve, almost disbelieve the existence of spirituality in every way. To us, even religion has become just mental and physical. Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, when he met Sayyidina Khidr, Allah told him, how can I meet him? Allah gave him instructions. You want to meet Khidr? This is how you meet him. Why did he want to meet him? Once Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam was asked, there are different narrations. One narration says that he was asked, who is the most knowledgeable? Who is the most knowledgeable person upon the earth? Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam said, I am. In another narration, Someone asked him, is there someone more knowledgeable than you? He said, no. Now, whatever his, the question, his answer was not incorrect. He was correct in what he said. Being the Prophet of Allah, who could have been more knowledgeable than Sayyidina Musa? No one. He brought the Torah, he brought the law, he taught the law. No one could have been more knowledgeable than him. So he was correct in what he said. But... As a Prophet of Allah, it wasn't befitting his position that he say, I am the most knowledgeable. As a Prophet of Allah, it was, beho- it was more behoving of him, it was more befitting him that he ascribed that knowledge to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah azza wa jal, as a result of this error, Allah tested him. And Allah told him that you are wrong, O Musa, there is someone more knowledgeable than you. And that person, Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, said, Oh Allah, someone more knowledgeable than me? So guide me to him, that I can learn of him. Take me to him. So Allah told him, okay, these are the instructions for you to find your way to this person who is more knowledgeable than you. Now what are the instructions? Amazing. Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, Allah, the way he describes the story in the Quran, they left with their, he left with his attendant, Yusha ibn Nun alayhi salatu wasalam. They took provisions with them for the journey, food, a cooked fish in a basket. They were tired, they rested. Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam rested, Khidr alayhi, uh, sorry, uh, Yusha ibn Noon alayhi salatu wasalam rested. Before the, be, Sayyidina Musa was resting, before the very eyes of Yusha ibn Noon, the f- cooked fish, the cooked fish leapt out of the basket. It came alive. It leapt out of the basket, plunged into the sea. But how? Not one drop of water touched the fish. As it leapt, a tunnel formed. A tunnel formed in the water of the ocean. And it disappeared into that tunnel. Without touching water, without one drop of water touching the fish. Yusha ibn Noon was amazed. He didn't want to disturb Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, so he made... A mental note that I will tell him afterwards. When Musa alayhi salam awoke, he forgot. So they carried on. They carried on. Later, Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu salam said to him, This journey has been very, very tiring. Give us our food. Then Yusha ibn Noon remembered. He had no fish. The fish had disappeared miraculously into the sea. So he mentioned it. Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu salam said, You should have told me before. He said, I forgot. And it was only Shaytan who made me forget. So he said, Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu salam said, you should have reminded me or you should have told me then because that was our, our sign. There we were supposed to meet Khidr. So they retraced their steps, went back all the way to where this fish disappeared miraculously into the sea. When they arrived, Khidr alayhi salatu salam was sitting there, leaning against a rock. Now the whole thing, it was strange. But that's the spiritual world. Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam said to him, As-salamu alaykum. Khidr alayhi salatu wasalam replied with salam, but he also said something else to him. He said, Wa anna bi ardika salam. He said, O oh Musa, you give me salam. You give me the greetings of peace. But where is there peace in your land? There is no peace in your land. Then 
an exchange took place between Khidr alayhi salam and Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. The whole conversation, their dialogue, their journey, their experiences, the whole thing is wondrous and amazing. He said to him, I wish to follow you. Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu realized that here was something, here was a treasure that even he did not have. Knowledge that he did not possess. And he humbled himself and he said, I will follow you. Sayyidina Khidr told him no. Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu persisted. He told him no. He persisted, he told him no. You cannot follow me, you cannot learn off me. Imagine someone being able to say to Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, you cannot follow me. That same Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, there are so many stories of him. On Ma'raj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he gave the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam the gift of salah, the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam asked the Prophet of Allah, what did your Lord give you? What did your Lord give you? No Prophet of Allah said anything. When he passed by Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, he told him, oh, he gave me 50 salah. He said, go back. <coughs> he said, go back and tell Allah to reduce it. Ten times the Prophet, nine times the Prophet sallallahu alayhi went back. On the tenth time, he still told him, go back. Five salah is too much. Your ummah will not be able to cope with five salah. There's only one person who said that, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. And... Of all the Anbiya, it was only Musa alayhi salatu salam who said to Sayyidina Adam, Allah, the Prophet mentions this in the hadith, hadith called by Imam Bukhari and others. He said to Musa, of all the Prophets of Allah, only one person said this. He said to Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, you are our father, but you, because of your error, you took us out of Jannah and you brought us into the dunya. Why? Why? So Sayyidina Adam alayhi salatu was salam said to him, O Adam, O Musa, how long before my creation did Allah write the Torah? Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu was gave him an answer. According to one narration, it was 40 years. And according to another narration, a great length of time. So Sayyidina Adam alayhi salatu was salam said, O Musa, do you Rebuke me for something which Allah had already decreed against me long before my creation. So the Prophet ﷺ says, Fahajja Adam Musa, that in this instance, thrice he said it, that Musa, Adam alayhi salatu was salam, he defeated Musa alayhi salatu was salam in this discussion. Thrice he said it. But that was Musa alayhi salatu was salam. He would say, What do you want to anybody? Anybody. And here, he's telling Khidr alayhi salatu wasalam, I want to follow you, I want to learn off you. And Khidr alayhi salatu wasalam, no, you cannot follow me. You cannot learn off me. He pleaded with him. Eventually they agreed. Sayyidina Khidr alayhi salatu wasalam said, you follow me on the condition that you do not say anything, you don't even ask a question until I tell you. You don't even speak, no matter what happens. He agreed. And before that, he also said to him, one of the reasons why I'm refusing you is because you cannot be patient. You will not be patient. He promised him, I'll be patient. It's a very long story. I'm only summarizing. Then he took him on a journey. What a journey. They both went on a ship. The people granted them a favor by carrying them for free. Musa alayhi salatu was was watching. Khidr alayhi salatu wasalam began ripping the planks of the ship in order to scuttle the ship. Musa alayhi salatu could not contain himself. What are you doing? These people, they carry us for free, and this is the way you reward them. You scuttle their ship. So what did I tell you? Don't ask anything. Okay. Forgive me. Then, and this is quite frightening, he's, they both land. When they land, they're walking, and they see some children playing. Khidr alayhi salatu was salam goes, and grabs one of the children and he rips his head off. He kills him. Musa alayhi salatu salam said, Now this is too much. You scuttle the ship, that's your reward, that's your gratitude. 
And this innocent, blameless child, you actually kill him. So what did I tell you? You are not to speak, you are not to ask anything. Okay, forgive me. If I now ask again, you will have proof against me. They go through a village. Both Musa alayhi salam and Khidr alayhi salatu salam. They ask people for food. They actually ask them. Nobody feeds them. Nobody bothers feeding them. They actually ask people then for food. Despite asking, nobody feeds them. This is all in the Quran. So as they're about to leave the village hungry, you can imagine Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu salam's anger by now. And as they're leaving, there's a wall that's very weak, crumbling, and it's about to collapse. Sayyidina Musa alayhi, Sayyidina Khidr alayhi salatu salam begins busying himself repairing the wall. So this is just far too much for Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam. Those people took them for free on the ship, they scuttled the ship. This whole village expels them from the village without giving them one morsel of food, and he repairs a wall for them. So he spoke to me, he said, look, هَذَا فِرَاقُ بَيْنِي this is the point when we must part. You can no longer remain with me. But before you depart, I will enlighten you about all of these experiences. And then he explains to him why he scuttled the ship, why he killed the child, why he repaired the wall. He scuttled the ship because he was actually doing them a favor. Ahead of them, there was a pirate king a pirate ruler of the, sea, of the waters, of the ocean, of the seas. And he would <coughs> occupy, ransack, overtake any ship that pleased him, that looked good to him, that looked valuable to him, and he'd kill the crew. So Khidr alayhi salatu salam scuttled the ship so that it wouldn't even come to the attention of this pirate. That was his reward. They'd make it safely to the shore without any harm. The child was evil, and the parents were humble, pious folk. And this child was evil, and he would have driven them to despair and to evil. And Allah wished to have, have mercy on the parents, so Allah removed this evil child, and Allah was to replace the child with one who was more faithful, dutiful and obedient to those parents, who were pious in their own right. And as far as the wall was concerned, beneath the wall, there was a hidden treasure. And that treasure belonged to orphans. And the orphans had a very pious father who had died. And it was the wish of that father, and it was also the wish of Allah, that these children would inherit that treasure themselves by discovering it themselves when they grew old enough and strong enough to fend for themselves. Had the treasure been revealed before their age, then the, the same people of the village who wouldn't give a morsel of food to the, to the Prophet of Allah والسلام, and his companion, they would have stolen the treasure. It may all seem rather simple, but this is why Khidr والسلام, repaired the wall. And had they continued, as the Prophet والسلام, says in a hadith recorded by Bukhari as well as others, Prophet ﷺ said, May Allah have mercy on Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. Had he been more patient, we would have learned much more. Now, the reason for mentioning this story is Allahu Akbar. More than any of the other stories of Surah Al-Kahf, this story reveals to us the two very different worlds of the spirit and of matter, of materialism and of spirituality. There's a completely different world out there, and that is the spiritual world. And Khidr alayhi salatu was salam, the experiences that he shared with Musa alayhi salatu salam were all very spiritual ones. And Khidr alayhi salatu salam was demonstrating to Musa alayhi salatu salam that there is something much more than what's apparent, and what you can see, and what you can feel. This is why we believe in the qadr of Allah. We believe in fate, we believe in destiny, we believe in the qadr of Allah. We trust in Allah. We rely upon Allah. Even when calamity strikes us, we still have hope and we believe that even in this calamity there is khayr. There is good in this calamity. They, and we do not know what Allah has planned for us, what He has in store for us. 
This is belief in spirituality. This is belief in Allah. This is belief in the unseen. This is reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is trust in Allah. And this is also part of our belief, part of our faith. That it's not the body that we should be concerned, we should be concerned with. Rather, it's the spirit. Meaning, look after the spirit. Care for the spirit. Nourish the spirit. Treat the spirit. Just as prevention is better than cure for the body, we should also engage in prevention from illness, prevention of illnesses and diseases rather than working later on the cure for the heart also. It's very important. Otherwise, the diseases of the heart will kill off a person altogether. And he may live and continue to live as an apparently healthy, strong, sturdy individual. Successful even. But in reality, only he is successful who purifies his soul. And he is a loser, no matter how apparently successful he may be, if his spirit doesn't flourish, if he stunteth the growth of his spirit, if he reduces his spirit, and he does not purify it. Rasulullah being the most pure of all people, many authors of hadith have related this dua, that he would f- constantly pray, Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha wa zakkiha ant khayru man zakkaha ant waliyuha wa maulaha He would pray, O oh Allah, grant my soul, my nafs is taqwa. Wa zakkiha ant khayru man zakkaha and purify it. For Allah, you are the one who is the best of all purifiers. You are the best of all who can purify the soul of mine. For you are its guardian and you are its master. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would actually make this dua often. Being the Prophet of Allah, oh Allah, purify my soul. Today, we also need to be concerned about the purification of the soul. Unfortunately, because of our belief in materialism, reliance in materialism, reliance in material things, we doubt or deny spirituality altogether. And we indulge ourselves only as far as the body is concerned. That's materialism in its most, in its gross, extreme sense. Look at the lives of the Sahaba, radiyallahu anhum, they reached a stage whereby the body meant nothing to them. It was all to do with the Akhirah. There are many examples of the Iman of the Sahaba, the spirituality of the Sahaba, the spirituality of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's where the real strength and power of a Muslim lies, in his spirituality. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a tawfiq to understand. Allah makes us amongst those who do not just rely on wealth, on material things, who do not indulge themselves as far as the spirit, as far as the body is concerned, but those who also focus on their ruh, on their spirit, on their hearts. Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says in a hadith of Bukhari that inna fil jasad al mudghatan ida salahat salah al jasad kullu, wa ida fasadat fasad al jasad kullu ala wahi al qalb. Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, no, there is a piece of flesh in the body. Which if it's pure, then the whole body is pure. Which if it's corrupt, then the whole body is corrupt. Know that that piece of flesh is a heart. This small piece of flesh purifies a person or corrupts a person. And the purification and the corruption, the strength or the weakness, the health or the lack of health that the Prophet ﷺ speaks of here is not the bodily, bodily, physical health of a person, Rather, it's a spiritual health. It's a spiritual strength. And it's a spiritual corruption that the Prophet is speaking of. He's not discussing anatomy here. Astaghfirullah, some people have had the gall and the audacity to suggest that the Prophet is not even referring to spirituality here. He's only discussing the anatomy of the body. That if the, if the heart is pure and healthy, then the body will be healthy. And if the heart is unhealthy, then the body will be unhealthy. Which in itself is true. But here, that's not what Rasulullah is referring to. Prophet is referring to the ruh, the spirit. If spiritually the heart is corrupt, then the whole body is corrupt. I.e., the body will engage in the most sinful of deeds. Because the heart is corrupt. When the heart is pure, the body is pure. In a hadith of Bukhari, the Prophet quotes Allah. Allah says... My servant does not come as close to me as he does by fulfilling those obligations which I have placed upon him. By doing these, my servant come close to me. 
And then speaking of the closeness of a servant to Allah, Allah says, I then become his eyes with which he sees, his ears with which he hears, his hands with which he touches, and even his feet with which he walks. What does that mean? Every part of his body, every piece of flesh in his body is engaged in the remembrance of Allah and is engaged in the obedience of Allah. It fears the disobedience of Allah. His eyes do not move, his eyes do not gaze and look, but with the pleasure of Allah. He does not listen to anything that pleases Allah. His hands do not touch, except that which pleases Allah. Now, when the heart is pure, that's how the body becomes. When the heart is corrupt, then the whole body is corrupt. Prophet ﷺ isn't discussing anatomy here, or the physical state of the body. He is discussing the spirit, the ruh, and the heart, and the effect of the heart on the whole body. That's why we should concern ourselves with dhazkiyah. Dhazkiyah means the purification of the heart. And dhazkiyah is about spirituality. Like I said, religion is all about spirituality. Today, we have a very, some people believe in and practice a very materialistic religion. Where everything is about the body and everything that you can touch and feel. But anything which you can't, then people don't believe in it. So many people now, they openly deny the existence of jinns. They don't believe in anything spiritual. Even though there is a spiritual world out there. It's potent, it's powerful, it's strong. Sometimes in order to describe this, I mention a hadith. It's a very beautiful hadith. Once Prophet ﷺ was leading Fajr Salah. Whilst he was leading Fajr Salah, I often mention this hadith because people, they don't understand the connections between our actions and their spiritual effects. We all know that in Islam we are taught respect. I've mentioned many times before, you cannot learn, you cannot benefit from knowledge, you cannot gain knowledge unless and until you show respect. Until you respect that knowledge, until you respect the items and the instruments of knowledge, and until you respect the people of knowledge, you will not gain knowledge yourself. Now where's the connection? Respect and the gaining of knowledge. Apparently there's no connection. This is it. We may not understand it, but we should believe in it. We should accept it. Let me give you one connection. It's not something we can understand. Once Prophet ﷺ was leading Fajr Salah, he, despite being the Prophet of Allah, he was a human being. And during Fajr Salah, Prophet ﷺ experienced some difficulty in his recitation. He made one or two errors in his tilawah of the Qur'an. So he was struggling with the tilawah of the Qur'an in Fajr Salah. Only part of it, maybe one or two verses. After Salah, Prophet ﷺ turned round to the congregation and he said to them, when you come for Salah, Make sure you complete and perfect your wudu. During the salah, I was asking myself, what's wrong with me that I am struggling with the Qur'an? And then it's emerged that some of you have not completed your wudu properly. They have not perfected your wudu. And if I remember correctly, the Prophet was from speaking only of one person. One person didn't complete his wudu properly. His imperfect and incomplete wudu had such an effect on himself and on the congregation that even had an effect on the Imam who was a prophet of Allah. And it affected his tilawah of the Holy Qur'an because he didn't complete his wudu. Now imagine, one person not completing their wudu has an effect on the tilawah of the Qur'an of another person. Who was the other person? The one who would actually receive the wahi. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's a spiritual world. Just like the story of Khidr alayhi salatu wasalam and Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. We may not understand the connection, but it's there. That's why in Islam, we believe in spirituality in such a deep way. Even though we may not understand the connections, we believe in it. And we've reached the age. Why I'm emphasizing this is because we live in a very materialistic age. This is the age of science, of technology, 
of technological progress, of computers, of bits and bytes. I'm not just using fancy words, you'll understand what I'm trying to say. We live in an age where everything is being explained to us. Computers are amazing, but at the root level, at their very basic core, they are just ones and zeros, bits and bytes. And everything can be explained. That look, physically, logically, this is what happens. A happens, and then B takes place. C is a consequence of B. D comes as a sequential, inevitable result of C. And so on. Two and two make four. Everything is perfectly explained as a very logical, very systematic. So everything's physical. So people are now only believing and accepting that which is physical. Fewer and fewer people are believing in Allah. Fewer and fewer people are believing in spirituality, in creation, in the creation. Pe- fewer and fewer people are believing in a creator. Everybody, well not everybody, many many people are now almost just relying on that which is physical. Now as Muslims we have been affected. We have been deeply affected. That's why I call it materialistic Islam where people say, you know, we are Muslims, we pray, we, we believe. But Allah, but their actions, their behavior seem to reflect that they only trust and they only believe in things that are material. They deny spirituality. They doubt spirituality. They don't believe in jinn. They don't believe in the existence of spirits. They don't, believe in, they don't pay any attention to the ruh whatsoever. And they completely mock and ridicule any connection between two things in Islam that they cannot understand. As Muslims, we accept all the spiritual effects. The spiritual effects of the diseases of the heart, the spiritual effects of our actions, even though we may not understand them. If you go to a village, if you go to some backward region, some developing region of the world, and you explain some of the scientific things that we are very familiar with, because they've never experienced them, they don't know them, they will deny them. They will deny it altogether. Why? If we people, we tend to deny what we don't understand. And that's what Allah confirms in the Quran. Allah says, Nay, they have rejected that which they could not fully comprehend and whose explanation has not yet come to them. These are the clear words of the Quran. They rejected that which they could not comprehend fully and whose explanation has not yet come to them. So simply because they did not understand it, they rejected it. And that's what many of us do. What we don't understand, we are enemies of what we do not understand. What we don't understand, what we can't fully comprehend, we completely deny. But that is not the position of a believer. We may not be able to physically, we may not be able to logically understand or explain to people how these lights come on. You press a switch there and the light comes on. But to us it's normal, it's an everyday occurrence. So we don't pay any attention to it. And I've explained this before that the spiritual world is one thing, the material world is one thing. You know, Allah rewards a person for their efforts and for their sacrifice. So if you make sacrifices in the material world, you make sacrifices in the material world, you will make progress in the material sense. And if you make sacrifices... And if you make an effort in the spiritual world, you will make headway. You will make gains. And you will progress spiritually. Now when we look at the non-Muslims, they have made an effort. As far as the dunya is concerned, they make their sacrifices. And they make the efforts. As a result, they make their progress. And what we are doing, is we are following in their footsteps and we are only trying to make progress in the material world we make the same material sacrifices but not for spirits not for the spirits or for the akhirah we make material sacrifices for the sake of materialism now i've given this example before you go to the eastern part of the world where people still believe in spirit and in spirituality although we don't accept it buddhism is all about spirituality and there are many people in the Eastern world that in, engage in these spiritual practices and exercises. Now, we may deny it, but there are people there who practice 
certain things, even though they are not Muslim, they can accomplish spiritual feats that we may not understand. We may even deny unless we see them ourselves. Now, is that possible? People who go without food for many days on end, they bury themselves in the, in the ground and they breathe only through a small hole for days on end. They levitate above the ground. Is that possible? Of course it's possible. Levitating is possible. They do it. Now, what's that? Surely these aren't spiritual powers in a pure sense because they're not Muslim. Well, this is it. That's the spiritual world. In the spiritual world, you have good and evil. You have good and bad. Just as in the physical material world, you have good and bad. And these people, despite being non-Muslims, you know what? They've devoted themselves to the spiritual world. They've made sacrifices and they've made progress. Now, some of these people, they don't know much about materialism at all, i.e. Uh, they don't know much about matter, they don't know much about science and technology. It's true. They're completely lost in their own world. And if you told them that man has actually, he's gone beyond the frontiers, he's gone beyond the boundaries of the earth, he's ripped the earth's atmosphere, and he's touched the frontiers of space. A man has actually landed on the moon. Some of these people, they might, whilst they're listening to you, they might actually be levitating five foot off the ground, but they laugh at you and they won't believe you. They won't believe you that man has actually landed on the moon. They don't believe you and you don't believe them. They don't believe you in what you're reporting and you won't believe them because they're actually levitating off the ground. You can't believe how they possibly do that. This is it. That's the extreme spiritual world. This is the extreme material world. These people have made progress in the material world because that's what they believe in passionately and that's what they've devoted themselves to. And they've made their sacrifices. Those who believe in, the, in spirituality, even if it's bad, astaghfirullah, even then they make progress. So imagine a believer who believes in spirituality in a pure sense, makes the necessary sacrifices. He will progress in the purest of senses. He will progress in a pure way. There is a spiritual world out there. And sadly, we are so affected by materialism, we are beginning to doubt it or deny it altogether. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the tawfiq to understand. Allah gives us the tawfiq to strike the balance and to recognize that it's not the body and it's not the material world that is real. It's the spiritual world that takes precedence. It's our ruh and our spirit that makes us who we are and what we are. And that we need to devote ourselves to the spiritual world and to our own spirits more than we devote ourselves to matter, to materialism and to the physical world. And in doing so, we will, through the will, by the will of Allah and his tawfiq, we will be successful. As Allah has said in the Qur'an, it's all about the spirit. Swearing on all of these objects of his creation, Allah says, قَدَ فَلْحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا Indeed, he is successful who purifies that soul. And indeed, he has lost who does not purify the soul, but rather allows it to become deviant and wayward. We pray just as Rasulullah prayed, that Allah grant our souls their taqwa and purify our souls. For you are the best of all who does or who can purify these souls. For you are the guardian and the master of our souls. وصلى الله وسلم على عبده ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك. This lecture was given by Sheikh Abu Yusuf Riyadh al Haq and has been presented to you by Al Kothar Productions. For further information, additional lectures and books, contact us on 0121 or alternatively by post at Al Kothar Productions, P.O. Box 6008, Birmingham, B10 0UW.